October 1944. A British bomber is in big trouble. Over the Arctic Circle, hit by flak during a top secret mission. Two engines damaged and leaking fuel. The pilot has been trying to keep her in the air for two hours. But finally, he loses the battle. This is all that remains of a Royal Air Force Lancaster from Bomber Command during World War II. But it's not just any Lancaster, because it belonged to 617 Squadron, the famous Dambusters. And it's the only one that still survives of their aircraft. And the reason why this wreckage sits inside the Arctic Circle is as legendary as that famous dam's raid itself. Right, directly beneath it's just one chapter in an extraordinary story about an elite bomber squadron which helped change the course of a war. You could hear it go ping. One that for many has remained largely unknown for almost 70 years. We counted 400 holes in the aeroplane. Hidden amongst top secret documents and mission logs. So the highest level yes. of security. Yes. A story of heartbreaking setbacks. I shot down three Lancasters. I was completely out of my mind. And great personal triumph. Your bomb put this out of action. That's right. Of elite pilots and crews who flew the hardest missions. Ten times is a big bomb. As they took the fight to the heart of Hitler's war machine. The plan was to ship out one submarine every 56 hours. Did you shoot him down? Yeah. yeah, he's got him, boy. Right in the middle. Bloody good. Yeah. We reveal for the first time on television what the Dambusters did after the dance. In the early hours of May the 17th, 1943, 19 low flying RAF Lancasters carrying revolutionary new bombs which bounced on water, attacked three dams in the industrial heartland of Nazi Germany. Eight of the bombers were lost, and almost half of the 133 aircrew were killed. But they managed to breach two dams and flood a valley. The daring raid electrified a war-weary Britain. 34 gallantry medals were handed out, including a Victoria Cross to the raid commander, Guy Gibson. The Dambusters became national heroes and remain so to this day. Everybody knows the story of the Dambusters, everybody has seen the film, but of course the Dambusters were more than the dams. I'm John Nicholl. I was a navigator in the Royal Air Force during the first Gulf War in 1991. My tornado bomber was shot down and I bailed out into the Iraqi desert, ending up in the hands of Saddam Hussein's thugs. Since the Second World War, the legend of 617 Squadron has been etched in the souls of everyone who has served in the RAF, including me. We all think we know their story, but we don't. What we do know is that after the dams, they flew over a hundred operations. But what those were, and the impact they had on the course of the war, is largely unknown. The operational details classified, neglected, are just plain forgotten. So that's my quest to find out what this extraordinary squadron got up to in the last two years of the Second World War. It begins here in London, where the 617 operational records are held. Many were kept secret during the war and for years afterwards. Only recently have they all been declassified. Within them lies our story, and I intend to find it. 13th of July, 43, most secret. So highest level yes. of security. Yes.
the records reveal that after the success at the dams, RAF Bomber Command and its boss, Air Chief Marshal Harris, were at a loss to know what to do with their new elite unit. After they won their spurs with the dams raid and proved that they were capable of such precision, then Harris is actually now looking for opportunities to ex exploit that skill that they have. The opportunities were few and far between. And 617 was virtually broken. Only 77 of the 133 men who took part in the dams raid remained. The others were either dead or prisoners of war. It had few operational bombers left and no leader. Guy Gibson had been sent on a PR tour of America. It appeared as if, you know, nobody knew what they're going to do with us. Les Monroe, a New Zealander, was 24 at the time, a pilot and hero of the dam's raid. We did various forms of training, low-level training mainly. Uh, we did a lot of bombing training with practice bombs. When the training stopped, they were given a mission, but not the one they really wanted. It was special, but bizarre. Well, this document is saying that Harris has asked for permission to bomb Mussolini in Rome, and he wants to use a squadron of Lancasters, which he specifies as being 617 squadron. It is manned by experts and is kept for special ventures of this kind. Yes. The Foreign Office vetoed it because if this succeeded, there's no guarantee that the Italians would just roll over. After two months of doing nothing, 617 got the go-ahead to bomb Italy with paper. But dropping propaganda leaflets was not what heroes were supposed to do. And people wanted to know why. The question was being asked, we've got this squadron, we've got this new weapon, which is proven themselves to be extremely successful, but what do we do now? The now was a new order from Bomber Harris. 617's fortunes were about to change. A priority target which the RAF had been trying to destroy for months. They wanted 617 to succeed where everyone else had failed. September 1943. After two months without missions, the Dambusters are preparing to again fly their Lancasters deep into Germany. A low-level strike against a target far more important and dangerous than the Dams. One feeding Hitler's army with guns and ammunition. They were ordered to bomb a 160-mile-long canal, the Dortmund Ems. RAF Bomber Command had been trying to burst its banks for months. The Nazis were using it to move vast amounts of arms in canal boats, from the munition factories in Germany's industrial heartland to the Eastern Front. This was seen as an ideal opportunity to replicate the skills that were learnt on the Dams Raid of a low-level precision attack at night on a small target with the intention of a small force causing disproportionate amount of damage. When we come to the Labbergen, the canal is running above ground level. If you can breach that embankment, you would put it out of action. Breaching the canal could not be done with Barnes Wallace's trademark bouncing bombs. Instead, 617 used a new range of 12,000 pound blast bombs which would burst the canal banks if dropped in the right place. Previously classified operation files and logbooks show that the squadron's attack on the Dortmund Ems Canal was scheduled as a nighttime raid for September the 14th, 1943. They also reveal that their commanders knew they would be flying at low level into the teeth of enemy aircraft guns, exactly as they had at the dams. At around midnight, eight Lancasters loaded with 12,000 pound bombs took off from Eastern England for the thousand mile round trip. 
Leading four of the Lancasters was squadron leader David Maltby. 23 years old and one of Guy Gibson's heroes from the Dams Raid. His aircraft dropped the bouncing bomb which finally breached the Mona Dam. Now, just as they had at the dams, Maltby and his fellow pilots were flying at 150 feet over enemy territory. But this time, it was all going wrong. The weather was so bad, the raiding party was forced to turn back before it even got to the canal. And then things went from bad to worse. Maltby, at low level, crashed. The answers to what went wrong are at the Dortmund Ems Canal with David Maltby's nephew, Charles Foster. A historian who spent a lifetime investigating this part of 617's story. Your uncle was going to be the deputy force leader for the attack here? Yes, he was scheduled to be leading one of the sections of War Lancasters. The raid was aborted because of the weather conditions and uh, they were recalled and his uh, plane went down in the North Sea. So after all of that incredible career, that bravery, the awards, mm. he wasn't even shot down over here. No, unfortunately not. He wasn't. He, he, he was killed on a recall being sent home. Yes. That's a tragedy in itself. Maltby's death was a bitter blow to the veterans of the Dams Raid. Yes, I knew David pretty well. I knew him probably better than most of the others on that particular raid. Crews as a whole accepted the loss of a friend as a downside of what they were engaged in, war in the air. 617 were back in the air over the canal the very next night. This time, fog was their problem, obscuring much of the target, making pinpoint accuracy almost impossible. But they decided to attack. Anti-aircraft gunners were waiting and could see the Lancasters clearly even through the haze. And the raid's planners had underestimated how many guns were along the canal. They were flying into a wall of flak. Our flak directly beneath us. Right. Boy, I've got to know if you nothing like this before. Neither have I. Something which bomber crews had become accustomed to. When the shell exploded, little bits of shrapnel would hit the aeroplane. You could hear it go ping. And then you knew you'd been hit. You could sometimes smell, if you like, that cordite smell. They're firing at us now. That's a bit close. It's luck. That is luck where it's going to hit you. This time, 617 had been hit hard, and their luck was out. Over the direction. During the dams raid, mm -hmm. everything had gone together perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yet on here, just a couple of little factors yes. had meant that it all went wrong. It yes. fell apart. fell apart because they couldn't see the canal until they were directly above it. So they were flying in circles, trying to find the canal. Eventually, no, hold on. So they're 150 feet yep. in a Lancaster, yep. relatively slow, intense flak, and they're circling. That's an anathema to somebody <laughs> who has flown into combat, circling over yes. flak batteries. And the circling was in vain. Two managed to drop their bombs, one on the towpath, one on the water, and another one was shot down and crashed about 100 yards further down there. So all in all, a complete disaster. It was a complete disaster. Five of the eight Lancasters were lost. The canal was virtually untouched. Unlike the dams raid, the flak gunners had come out on top. And that may well be entirely due to Lady Luck. My journey to Dortmund has not only revealed the true extent of a disaster, it's also given an unexpected fresh insight into the dams raid. While investigating the strength of the German flak defences on the canal, I came across a German veteran 
who revealed how a schoolboy error saved at least one Lancaster from being shot down before it reached the dams. Johannes Dorwald is 85 years old. In 1943, he was 15, going to school by day and manning a flat gun by night. He was at his gun on the Rhine on the night of May the 16th when the dam busters flew right over him. Shortly before midnight, the first aircraft passed over. It looked to me as big as a barn, and I aimed for it. But in my excitement, I didn't release the safety coach. Well, then they got away. Johannes Dorwald believes now that had he released that safety catch, the raid might not have been the success it was. Afterwards, I was so full of regret. Maybe people died because of that. About 2,000 died that day at the Myrna Dam. But the young Dorwald got a second chance, after the dam had been breached. In the early hours, the aircraft came back from the Myrna Dam. It was a bright night, and I could see the aircraft really clearly in all of its details. And then I aimed for it, and it went down. The losses on the dam's raid were bad enough, but the casualty toll at the canal was far worse. 41 men died, including 13 who'd survived the dam's raid. The losses proved that low-level operations of that nature simply were not viable. On the dam's raid, they'd been fortunate. On the Dorpenems Canal, it was the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin meant a change of fortunes and the dam busters earning another nickname, the Suicide Squadron. It was the squadron's blackest moment. To make matters even worse, 617 had lost most of its senior officers in the raid. It had no leader. Forcing Bomber Command to turn to one of its brightest and bravest pilots, who was given orders to sort the mess out. He had a mountain to climb. As the once secret records and logbooks in the Q archive reveal, after the disaster at the Dortmund Ems Canal, morale at what was left of 617 Squadron hit rock bottom. Further bombing missions had been put on hold, and replacing the crews they had lost was proving difficult. Their nickname, the Suicide Squadron, was starting to stick. But they had a new commanding officer, and he had other ideas. Wing Commander Cheshire was the person who could actually rebuild 617 Squadron at that time. Leonard Cheshire was already one of the RAF's most decorated pilots and its youngest Wing Commander. He was 26 years old. Cheshire knew he had his work cut out to return the squadron to its former glory. And he didn't waste any time. He was a natural leader and uh, led by his manner and his style of leadership. The first move was radical and ended 617's signature specialism. Low-level precision bombing at night. Flying low, the Lancasters were no match for Germany's flat gunners. So the squadron was to retrain and drop their bombs from high altitude with new precision bomb sites. It solved one problem, but gave them another. Hitler's fighter pilots. Lancasters were especially vulnerable to their speed and heavy machine guns. Peter Spoden was 19 when he joined the Luftwaffe in 1941. By the time the dam busters were in business, he was a 21-year-old veteran who knew the Lancaster's weak spot, a soft underbelly. On the Lancaster, they did not have any weapons below. 
the radio operator is telling you, okay, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, more to the right, more to the right. You should see him now. Then your son saw this black shadow of this big Lancaster. The British always flew like this, thinking that uh, they could avoid uh, exact shooting by a rider. Keep waving, Cam. Yeah? OK, keep waving. If you made a fast attack, that was a surprise for them. But Lancasters did have one defence against the fighters who snuck up on them from behind, rear gunners. David Fellows was 18 when he became one. This is your office. That is my home. And there's very little protection. There's just a piece of flimsy just perspex. Just flimsy perspex. We took the perspex out. So at 20,000 feet, you were sitting in minus 20 degrees. That's right. And you had icicles hanging down <laughs> from the oxygen mask. <laughs> really? Yeah. We relied on each other all the way through. That's my right. skipper used to call me up about every 15 minutes. Mm. Dave, you all right? Keep your eyes open, mid upper. Very good, Skipper. Okay, rear gunner. Okay, good show, boys. An air gunner didn't stop working. You were looking for fighters. And if we was to see one, your heart might have beaten a little bit faster. He saw us, we saw him at the same time. It shoot. Press the button. In 10 minutes, I shot down three Lancasters. I was completely out of my mind. But it wasn't always the night fighters who got the upper hand. Occasionally, Dave Fellows would hit the mark too. And we were continuously firing guns at each other. It was like a little battle, if you like, bang, bang, bang. I could see my bullets hitting him. But I couldn't miss him. <laughs> Not at that range. And I kept on even when he started to flick over. Where is he, uh, rear gunner? Can you see him? Down! 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 He's top down! He's yeah, top down! down. Did you shoot him down? Yeah. yeah, he's got him, boy! Right in the middle! Bloody good! Yeah. Bloody good! Bloody good. Bloody good. Bloody good. Bloody good. Okay, don't shout all the one. Wing Commander Cheshire backed his gunners to deal with the fighter menace. But he still had to find a way of retaining the squadron's famed precision and their reputation for going after the targets no one else could take out. The solution would mean putting his own life on the line. While his squadron flew high, he would take his own Lancaster down as low as 50 feet to drop marker bombs onto the center of the intended target. It meant flying into the heart of the enemy's deadly defences. Cheshire used the new tactic on February the 8th, 1944, at Limoges in France. The Germans were churning out aircraft engines at a huge factory, using French civilians as the workforce. While 11 Lancasters, each loaded with a 12,000-pound bomb, climbed to 10,000 feet, their commander flew down to the target. But Cheshire didn't drop his markers immediately. As he circled the factory, it became clear to his watching crews what he was up to. Draw him at a low level, flying over the factory, then again, and then again, to allow the French workers to get out before the factory was actually attacked. Leonard Cheshire was trying to give the French civilians time to vacate the targets uh, so that they weren't subject to the actual bombing themselves. The workers ran from the factory. So when Cheshire finally dropped his markers, the squadron was able to flatten the target without civilian casualties. That was one of the most successful raids I'd ever been on. And it really was a good one. The marking of French factory targets demonstrated that accurate, precision, low-level marking was possible. And because that was possible, then accurate bombing was possible. It was a breakthrough. 
making March 1944 a big month for the Dambusters. They also celebrated their first birthday, knowing they were back on top. The squadron went from strength to strength. Those who had survived from the very first days believed this newfound strength was entirely due to their commanding officer. Probably the one man, though, who really developed a sense of admiration and respect for his abilities. Without doubt, the finest squadron commander I served under. But there was little time for complacency. As new boys joined the elite band of flyers, they were about to take part in the most important action of the war. D-Day. Like everyone else, the Dambusters were to play a part, but not one they expected. The Germans knew the invasion was coming, but they didn't know exactly where. The Allies wanted them to believe it was going to be near Calais, when in fact, it was to be Normandy. A diversion was needed, and that's where 617 came in. They were to invent a fake invasion fleet. Les Monroe was by then already a veteran, a pilot who could fly with pinpoint accuracy. In the early hours of June the 6th, Monroe found himself involved in an audacious attempt to create a false flotilla of Royal Navy ships, which would appear to be heading for the coast of France. The operation itself started at a predetermined point on the English coast and flew towards the French coast at 180 miles an hour at 3,000 feet uh, for two and a half minutes. While flying in precision formation, Les and the rest of the squadron dropped strips of tinfoil called window to fool the German radar operators. Then did a slow turn lasting one minute, stopped dropping window on the turn, and on the back trip, we dropped window again. These repeated circuits created the illusion that a fleet of ships was moving towards the French coast. 617's formation flying continued through the night for eight hours. As dawn broke, German radar picked up the ghost ships and their shore batteries opened up on a non-existent fleet. Meanwhile, around 60 miles away, the Allies were hitting the beaches of Normandy. The invasion of France had begun. It was the end of the beginning but Adolf Hitler was far from finished. While he fought the Allies on the ground in Europe, he planned to deliver Britain a killer blow by using weapons of mass destruction invented by his engineers and rocket scientists. The V-2 was intended to be the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. The V stood for vengeance. They climbed to a height of around 60 miles before hitting their target at supersonic speed. The Nazis launched more than 3,000 of them, killing about 5,000 people. Hitler's rocket scientists were working on more powerful versions, which would be able to reach as far as America, and which would be launched from this new complex near Calais protected by a huge concrete cover which the Germans believed no conventional bomb could penetrate. That was before the Dambusters again teamed up with the man who'd invented their bouncing bomb. Barnes Wallace had always believed that the way to win the war was to develop massive earthquake bombs. Huge, highly aerodynamic explosive devices with delayed fuses which would put any concrete structure out of action. Not by a direct hit, but by a near miss, which drilled deep into the ground. 
before exploding and sending shockwaves through the Earth. He called them tall boys. Each was 21 feet long, weighing 12,000 pounds. And 617 Squadron was going to use them for their most ambitious and important mission yet. In the summer of 1944, Hitler's secret V-2 rocket base on the northern coast of France was ready to bombard Britain. And 617 Squadron was going to launch a strike against it. On July the 17th, 16 Lancasters loaded with tall boy bombs headed for France and the site which was covered by a massive concrete dome. The plan was to dislodge the dome by creating a mini earthquake. Very few of those who flew the mission are alive today. John Bell is one of them and had a crucial job. He was a bomb aimer. And John, you would be heading up that way over the main spar? Yes, that's Cause right. Because you're yes. a tall fella. Yes, yes. And that's fairly cramped in there. Being 20 years old and skinny, I could manage to get through a lot of uh, difficult places. Today, he's getting back into his position for the first time since his days with 617. Bomb A, Matt, could you get me a pinpoint, please? It's as if it was only yesterday. Ten minutes from the target, we would start by looking at the ground. Bomb doors open. Bomb doors open. Left, left. Steady. Steady. It called for very close cooperation between the bomb aimer and the pilot. If the aircraft was slipping to one side or the other, the bomb aimer could call the pilot to correct it. 20. Bombs away. 30. There goes the cookie. Everything had to be exact, and you had to maintain straight level flight for some minutes. 70 years ago, John Bell looked down from 18,000 feet at the huge dome, squinting through one of the world's first computerized bomb sites. Known as a stabilized automatic bomb site, it worked out the exact release point for the operator, making 617 even more accurate. You put your crosshairs where we are now. Where we are now. Is this the first time you've managed to get back to stand under your bomb sites? 70 years ago, I viewed the top of the dome from 18,000 feet. 18,000 feet, it was a small dot, but nevertheless was visible because it was in this short quarry. And now I'm standing on that small dot. <laughs> That's a ground, turnaround, isn't ground it? ground level, it's a lot larger. <laughs> where were you aiming at and where did it go? I was aiming at the dome. I can watch the trajectory of the bomb. Because when it comes out of the aircraft, yeah. it's flying at the speed of the aircraft. That's right. And then gravity takes over, but it's going in an arc. It is, but towards the end, you can see it travelling across the ground, because it's still travelling forward, and you can actually see so it So you can see it going, tracking? See it tracking across the ground. My bomb dropped some 20 feet to the side of the dome, which is a spot in front of us. So there. your bomb? Came oh, here. It, it looks about the right spot, so, yes. What's that? 15, 20 metres? Yes. I'd call that a direct well, hit. Well, it was, and I shouted bullseye. The bullseye was exactly that. The bomb entered the ground beside the dome, dislodged the supports, and wrecked Hitler's dream. The whole site was declared unsafe. Barnes Wallace's theory that a near miss was potentially more destructive than a direct hit had been proven. V2 rockets were never launched from this site. So you destroyed it. This virtually, was your target. Virtually was destroyed the uh, the uh, workings below the dome. Which you, was... you put this out of action. That's right. V2 missiles weren't the only super weapon Hitler had pointing at Britain. In great secrecy, 300 metres below ground in this chalk cliff quarry, just along the coast from his V2 complex, Allied spies had reported oh, wow. that his scientists were putting the finishing touches to another more fearsome threat. That's enormous. Cavernous. 
but they did not yet know what it was. In fact, you can still see the traces of the train. The answer lies deep down in these tunnels where few people have been since the war. With me is French historian Valérie Noël. So this is just one tunnel in a whole complex that goes another 100 metres beneath us? Yes. What sort of area does the site cover? Over two kilometres and a half. In July 1944, 17 Dambuster Lancasters took off from Eastern England with orders to bomb Hitler's new mystery weapon, each with a tall boy on board. As usual, Leonard Cheshire was crucial to the operation. To take out the complex, the Dambusters had to be more precise than ever. So his markers had to be more accurate than usual. They were aiming at concrete slabs with five exit holes, part of Hitler's secret weapon. This is one of them. Three tall boys missed, but a fourth clipped a corner of one of the slabs and drilled right through it. A thousand feet below, German engineers were putting the finishing touches to what they believed was an indestructible weapon. When the tall boy eventually went off, it caused the tunnels to collapse, burying anyone in them alive. Those above who survived never went back. Nobody's been down there since the day it was bombed. Nobody's been down there since the 6th July 44. It was to be months before the Allies discovered what Hitler's mystery weapon really was. When they ventured further down into the lower tunnels. Hitler scientists had been making a super gun built on three levels, consisting of 25 420 foot long tubes fitted with explosive boosters to increase the speed of the projectile. It was capable of firing supersonic shells into the heart of London at the rate of almost 600 an hour. The idea was to put the shell into the bridge block it would be sent into the main tubes and each time the shell would pass at the level of the additional charges and the charges would accelerate the speed of the shell to obtain a final speed of 1,500 meters per second. That means that the shell was living here and in less than two minutes it would be on to London. Had 617 not destroyed Hitler's supergun before it became operational? the outcome of the war might have been very different. The supergun raid was also the end of the road for the squadron's commanding officer. The day after it, Wing Commander Cheshire was stood down from operations. He'd completed a hundred bombing missions. The norm was 30. He was subsequently given a Victoria Cross, the country's highest award for valour for an extended period of sustained courage and outstanding effort. But for 617, there was no respite. Another impossible job was on the horizon, one that already carried the mark of failure. As the battle for Europe raged, the Germans were using troop trains to quickly move their army and equipment to the front lines. Targeting the track hadn't worked. No matter how many times the Allies blew up the lines, engineers simply replaced them. The best way to stop them was to take out Germany's railway viaducts. Knock them down and they would be out of action for years. This is the Bielefeld viaduct deep inside Germany. The bomb pockmarks around it are testimony to the Allies' efforts to bring it down. Initially, 617 tried to put it out of action with tall boys. John Langston was just 20 years old when he took part in those first efforts. The squadron had been attacking the Bielefeld viaduct for some days. Tens of thousands of small bombs had been dropped without bringing it down. As the raids continue to fail, 
617 realised they needed an even bigger and smarter bomb. Once again, Barnes Wallace had the answer. And it was something he had been thinking about for most of the war. A massive earthquake bomb which could destroy almost any structure. He'd always had this in his mind. This is one of his super bombs. He'd been thinking about this for years. At 22,000 pounds, the bomb weighed twice as much as a London double-decker bus. He called his new bomb the Grand Slam. The casing had to be as thin as possible so that you could get the maximum amount of explosives in it, but it had to be thick enough so when it hit the earth, it didn't fall apart or explode prematurely. It's perfectly aerodynamic from the front to the tail. And what he did at the tail was he offset these fins. The fins act like a gyroscope, and so when the bomb is falling, it's spinning for that greater accuracy. These things were very expensive, and they were only kept for the absolute exceptional operations to try to ensure success. The cost of the new bomb was one thing. Finding a plane to carry it, quite another. 617's Lancasters were unable to handle such a mammoth weapon. The Grand Slam, the 22,000 ton bomb, 10 tons is a big bomb. But the designers of the Lancasters weren't going to be beaten by that. The manufacturers quickly built new, more powerful versions. It was a major achievement to get 22,000 pound bomb airborne. They put in more powerful engines and stripped out gun positions and other equipment to make the aircraft lighter. Such was the weight that the wingtips bent upwards by about six to eight inches on either side. It was quite a remarkable thing. Barnes Wallace only had time to carry out one field test on his new Super Bowl. The day after the first 22,000 pound bomb arrived in the bomb dump. On the 14th of March, 1945, a modified 617 Squadron Lancaster with a Grand Slam on board lumbered down an English runway and headed for the heart of Germany and the Bielefeld Viaduct. Barnes Wallace was a happy man. When we were dropping the first Grand Slams, he came up to see us and wave us off, you know, and say good luck. Only 24 hours ago, Wallace had finished his live testing of the Grand Slam on the Rangers. And now, 617 Squadron are 12,000 feet over here. The RAF's 22,000 pound bomb is 25 feet long and perfectly streamlined to give it maximum penetration power. And in a very short space of time, only a matter of a couple of minutes, they dropped the very first Grand Slam and then another 12 tall boy bombs. The tall boys missed, but the Grand Slam landed close by. It was enough. Two spans of the giant viaduct were totally destroyed. The crater left by the explosion was 60 feet deep and 200 feet wide. And it was a game changer. You can see some of the structure in the arches, and in the middle, you can see a much later structure. They brought it down in the middle of the bridge. This one bomb did the trick. It was worth every penny. The Grand Slam helped stop the flow of enemy troops and tanks. But whilst Hitler faced almost certain defeat on land, he maintained high hopes of winning the war at sea by building a fleet of super submarines and deploying the world's biggest battleship, known as the Beast. In Bavaria, Adolf Hitler was reviewing the state of the war. The Russians were advancing on him from the east and the British and the Allies from the west. Unless he could land a counterpunch from the sea, he was finished. 
and he had a plan. A fleet of new mega subs, faster and more deadly than new boats. If he could get them in the water, they could attack the Allied convoys and stem the flow of food and weapons. To make them on the north coast of Germany, he was using slaves to build a super factory on an unimaginable scale, capable of turning out three killer boats a week. 4,000 forced laborers, they would have worked here and they would have built these submarines uh, 24 hours a day. No one knows exactly how many died in the process. Marcus Mayer is a German historian who knows this place inside out. It looks crazy because it's so big, mm -hmm. but it's completely rational. Just as high and as long as it was needed to build this type of submarine. The new factory was purpose-built to withstand anything the Allies could throw at it and big enough to actually test each mega sub underwater. They brought the boat in here, mm -hmm. and they closed the gates, and then the chamber was flooded. They could get so much water in here that it simulated the boat being underwater exactly. in this chamber. Exactly. God. Unbeknown to the Germans, spies were watching. But surprisingly, they did nothing whilst the work continued. They waited because this was a project so important for the German Navy um, that they used everything they had to build this bunker and we wait until the last point to destroy it. So they let them bring everything here, they yeah, let exactly. them build it. Yeah. Only when construction workers started to pour cement into the 14-foot thick roof did the Allies make their move. On the 27th of March, 20 617 Lancasters set out for northern Germany. Seven were loaded with 10-ton Grand Slams fitted with time delay fuses. The same types of bomb they had used on the Bielefeld viaduct. They knew they could hit the bunker and there will be one weak spot. Right. Because the roof was not ready. The concrete was kind of wet. From 18,000 feet, using their computerized bomb sites to precisely line up on the roof, the Lancasters dropped their bombs one by one. 18 of them destroyed the buildings around the complex, but two Grand Slams hit the roof dead center at supersonic speed, slicing straight through the unset concrete. But the survivors told us for some time nothing happens. They came out from the protection sites and then the explosions started. 300 died when the bomb was finally went off. And when the dust settled, Hitler's super factory was still standing. But 617 Squadron had delivered a killer blow. The production line was damaged. The cranes were damaged. And they decided, OK, now we have to give it up because we cannot repair it. Hitler's mega U-boats were not the only threat to the Allied convoys. Launched in April 1939, the Tirpitz was the battleship Winston Churchill feared most. It was capable of wreaking havoc. She carried eight 16-inch guns and 28 others of formidable strength. The Nazis bragged she was unsinkable. Amongst the Tirpitz's 2,000 crew was 20-year-old gunner Klaus Orovede. We were proud to work on such a modern ship. It was the biggest ship in the world at that time, with the most advanced weaponry. The Tirpitz caused Churchill sleepless nights, and he nicknamed her the Beast. He knew that if she got out into the North Atlantic, she would decimate the convoys. He sent five aircraft carriers to hunt her down. The Royal Navy caught up with her in April 1944. She was hiding in a Norwegian fjord. Even though she wasn't attacking convoys, Churchill still wanted her sunk. Despite 30 aerial attacks involving hundreds of Navy aircraft who scored 15 direct hits, Hitler's prized warship was badly damaged, but still afloat. 
While her crew desperately tried to repair her, RAF Bomber Command was called into action. The fjord the beast was hiding in was so remote it was too far for Lancaster bombers to reach. Or so the Fuhrer thought. Once classified records at Kew show that Churchill and his allies knew that to stand any chance of sinking the Tirpitz, they would have to send 617 Squadron and its six-ton Tallboy bombs. Getting to the beast was a round trip of some 4,000 miles, well outside the range of a Lancaster, especially one loaded with such a big bomb. Here she is, this lovely lady. We always used to give it a, a little old kiss before we got in. And we knew she would then fetch us back home safely. The boffins had a plan. They would strip their Lancasters to the bare bones, enabling them to carry much more fuel. So they could fly far enough to land in Russia, where they could refuel before going on to attack the Tirpitz. On September the 11th, 1944, 38 Lancasters from 617 and 9 squadrons set out on a journey of more than 2,000 miles the like of which had never been tried before. At times, to get under the German radar, it would mean having to fly below 300 feet. They were heading off into the unknown. And so from the Shetland Islands, they then actually turn towards the Norwegian coast. They arrived at the Norwegian coastline, this narrow gap between the German radar stations. They then across occupied Norway into neutral Sweden, then into Finland. And it's here that they're attacked by flak. They're crossing over the border and into Russia. And they describe the difficulties of looking down on a featureless landscape, desperately trying to find a point where they can say, right, I'm, I know that I'm here and their fuel's winding down. They're desperately trying to find this tiny little airfield, Jugodnik. At Jugodnik, they discovered that six aircraft had crash-landed during the trip. Of the remainder, 28 refueled and headed for the Tirpitz. Then it's attack track up this way, and then in to this northern tip where the Tirpitz is. Not only did the Lancasters and their tall boys get there, they caught the Tirpitz crew napping. We didn't believe they would reach us up there in the north. Even though they had been taken by surprise, the Germans weren't worried. They believed they had the upper hand. We had eight two-barrel cannons, 10.5 calibre. They were especially designed against aircraft at high altitude. The Tirpitz is seen firing her 15-inch guns. When, the when they started firing against aircraft, it was like a deafening noise. It was like a firework. But the deafening noise was no match for what the Lancasters were carrying. We saw the bombers come directly onto the target. I saw the tall boy underneath the aircraft. And then the bomb sank down a little bit and turned. The bomb was so quick, we could not follow it with our eyes. The first hit was through the foredeck. And it created a huge hole in the side. Then a bomb hit the chimney here. It tore the armament apart and went through the deck. The men moaned and howled. They all cried for their mothers. And that still sticks with me. Despite the direct hits 
and the torment below decks, the Tirpitz was still afloat. And 617 knew they would have to do it all over again. And this time, Surprise would not be their ally. Seven weeks later, 37 Lancasters again headed for northern Norway. This time, the Germans had obscured the beast with giant smoke machines. These pictures show how effectively the Tirpitz was concealed. Again, the smoke screen. This time, combined with bad weather, made bullseye bombing a hazardous venture. Struggling to see the battleship was one of 617's top men. A 26-year-old Australian pilot, Bill Carey, whose Lancaster carried the nickname Easy Elsie. Carey was not only trying to line up the Tirpitz for his bomb aimer, he was also flying straight into a barrage of flak. I have deep respect for the crews of these planes, because flying into a wall of fire and then getting your bomb onto the target, it takes something to do that. Carey and his crew continue to fly into the German firewall. Already hit by flak with one engine down, they made five more runs before they saw the battleship clearly enough to get their tall boy away. It missed, as did every other bomb. The mission had failed again. To make matters worse, Easy Elsie was hit a second time and a fuel tank was punctured. Carey and his six crew members had to decide whether to take to their parachutes or fly their stricken bomber on and try to make landfall. The crew stick with their skipper, who flies the faltering Lancaster more than 200 miles into northern neutral Sweden before crash landing it in a swamp inside the Arctic Circle. Amazingly, everyone on board survives. Only Carey, with a dislocated knee, is injured. Since that day in 1944, Easy Elsie has lain in the Swedish mud, largely forgotten. I've come to Sweden to find out what this long forgotten wreck reveals about Carey, his crew, and their Tirpitz mission. With me is conflict and aviation archaeologist Andy Brockman. If you look there, there's a number 591. That's a factory number. That's their mark. Yeah, that's their And that still survives. And that was the wing for Easy Elsie. It may be a mangled wreck, but this carcass is important. It's the only remaining Lancaster from 617 Squadron. And even after 70 years, it still has secrets to give up. We can see how the ground crews hastily removed weight for the long journey and exposed the crew to even greater risk. It's more important to the success of the mission to have an aircraft that's capable of carrying more fuel with greater range, capability of carrying the tall boy all the way to Norway, than it is for the aircraft to be able to defend itself if it runs into German fighters. This mm. was the Perspex dome yeah. that protected the mid-upper gunner. It's still here. That's right. And they've taken the dome off the top of the turret to smooth it across. They've simply taken the heavy guns out, yeah. the heavy ammunition, cut, 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 off, sheet over. That's it. Job done. Absolutely. The wreck also allows us to confirm Bill Carey's version of events. Things conspired against them. They'd been shot up, they'd lost an engine, they were leaking fuel. The remaining fuel would last for another 20 minutes at the outside. He spotted a large clearing in the forest, close by the shore of the lake. So he's here. Yeah. And he can see his landing field in front of him. I can put it down there. They've got the crew to go to their crash position. So they're back behind us now, up near the main plane, near the wings. Bill told the crew to brace themselves for impact. The force of that sudden stop must have been something. It would have been incredible. His left knee struck the compass and he dislocated his kneecap. 
With their skipper injured, the crew of Easy Elsie followed orders and tried to destroy the Lancaster so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. They tried to lodge the fire, and he's throwing all his maps and charts into a little pile, and there's fuel leaking out still. Then they fashion a little torch out of some wrapped up paper, throws it into the petrol, and runs, just like you did when you were a kid lighting a bonfire. Easy Elsie didn't burn, and the Swedish military took this photograph of her soon after the crash. The remoteness of her resting place has protected her from all but the hardiest of trophy hunters. Carey and his crew were sent back to Britain, where they rejoined 617 and the war. Meanwhile, in northern Norway, the beast was still armed and dangerous, while her crew frantically tried to repair her the Dambusters would have to give it a third go. The British had been trying to sink the Tirpitz for the entire war. Now, they were going to try again. 4 a.m., Sunday, 12th November. RAF Lancasters take off on a 1,200-mile flight to Norway, where the Tirpitz had eluded two recent attacks. 89-year-old Colin Cole was 20 in 1944. A bomber wireless operator who was hoping that, for 617 Squadron, it would be third time lucky. Colin is one of the few surviving veterans of that mission. It was early morning and the sun was just shining over the ship itself and I just saw it on the water in the distance. Brilliantly lit in sunshine. The Germans finally are caught by surprise. There is no smoke screen. Each Lancaster was carrying a six-ton tall boy bomb. They went after the battleship one after the other, as the squadron's previously classified records in queue reveal. Bomb number one hits port side. Still on board the beast was the young gunner, Klaus Rodweder. It goes through the ship and detonated. Bomb number two falls oh, over, over here, out, just outside yeah. the torpedo netting. Yeah. Number three, nobody, nobody wants to admit that because that one's miles <laughs> away. Four is a hit, five... But seven. even these ones, they're so close, would have been causing catastrophic damage as well. They make a hole and water comes in the ship. We know that this should be our last day on the ship. The fatal blow had not been delivered by a direct hit, but by another near miss. The sheer weight of water from the explosions forced the giant ship onto its side. Pilot dropped the bomb pulled away and the rear gunner got onto the intercom and said, hey Skip, she's turning over. I think we all thought that, oh, well, that's the end of that, so thank goodness for that, you know. The warship heels over into the shallow fjord. No one knows exactly how many German sailors died during the fight to sink Hitler's prize. Estimates vary between 950 and 1,200. And as the Lancaster circled, men were rescued from the freezing waters. Klaus Rohrwedder was one of them. Last plane came down and down so that they can see the men in the plane. They did not shoot us. So they were good soldiers. Germany's top soldier had run out of superweapons. The war was almost lost. But for 617 Squadron, there was one last mission against the man himself. On April the 25th, 1945, 16 Dambuster Lancasters joined a force sent to bomb the Eagle's Nest, Hitler's Alpine retreat. They destroyed its SS barracks with tall boys, but Hitler wasn't there he was already holed up in his Berlin bunker. Less than a week later, he was dead. 
So what I've discovered is this. In just two years after the famous raid on the dams, 617 Squadron flew over a hundred special operations. They were given more than 160 gallantry awards. But the Dambusters paid a heavy price for their success. 34 of their Lancasters were shot down or crashed, 189 of them were killed. I look back and I think, boy, I was lucky. It wasn't skill, it was the lucky chap who, who survived. They flew until they were wounded, jumping out, or you're burning. If I think about these fellows, it's still hurting me. As the few veterans who remain relive their finest hours with the aircraft they will never forget, their memories are what matter most. I looked out of both windows and it just felt normal. The earth had slipped by and I hadn't noticed it. <laughs> when was the last time you taxied in the Lancaster? Oh, 1944. I could picture you guys as young men heading off. What 617 Squadron went on to do after breaching those dams was not only truly amazing, it helped win the Second World War. English Co showing up now. Good to see old England again anyway. Yeah, after that long time. Boy, that's a sight for sore eyes, that is. Can't our uh, good friend the engineer give us a little bit of a song? Go on, Jock, tell me some bloody bashful. Don't head. give me the wind, go on. Come on, Jock. Where early falls the dew, and was there. And the Second World War drama continues here on Channel 5. Richard Burton's taking his mission behind enemy lines in Raid on Rommel. That's next. Yeah. 